All right. So we're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and look at verse number 22. It says, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men. The title for the sermon uh, this morning is, I am made all things to all men. I am made all things to all men. One thing that I can tell you right now is I am made a little bit uncomfortable. I put this jacket on. It's very humid. I'm sweating underneath. I don't want to take it off now because I'm going to be drenched in my shirt. I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, but we're making ourselves a little bit uncomfortable on this trip to Fiji. Okay? Look, I, I know you guys want to be as nice as you can to your pastor. And you know, you're telling me you slept really well and things are going really well. But I'm sure you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable. You know, especially if you've, you know, you've maybe not traveled overseas for a long time or for your first time. Maybe uh, the younger people, you're not used to being away from your parents. You're a little bit uncomfortable. And so, you know, what this missions trip is about is being a little bit uncomfortable. Making ourselves, making ourselves something that we aren't usually on a day-to-day -day basis. What we see in this passage, Paul says, to the weak became I as weak. Okay, that I might gain the weak. His desire is to win souls. And that's why we're here for this mission trip, is Amen. to win souls. And we need to put ourselves out of, outside of our comfort zones. I mean, coming to Fiji is already a little bit uncomfortable. Some of you guys are here stories where you're running around trying to get your passports organized. Last minute, not sure if it's all going to happen. Hey, I'm sure that was a bit uncomfortable. But you did it to win some souls, okay? Yeah, and, and we come to Fiji to, to win the souls of some Fijians. Look, why would God organize? I mean, obviously, this is the work of the Lord. Why would He organize Australians and, New, and uh, uh, I think we have some New Zealanders here as well and some uh, uh, Americans and some Canadians and uh, I think we're waiting... For someone from Korea as well to make their way here. Why, why would God organize people from all these different countries to come to Fiji? Is because, you know, there aren't enough soul winners here in Fiji. Like if there was enough soul winners, if there were enough soul winning churches, then this place would be taken care of. But God has allowed us to come together. And you know what? It's going to take us to be a little bit uncomfortable. And so look, I, I, kind, of, I kind of want to apologize. If so far you've been a little bit uncomfortable, but at the same time, I don't want to apologize because this is what a missions trip is about, right? Yeah. We haven't yeah. come to be in a five-star resort. Maybe later on, maybe some of you guys have plans after soul winning to go to your five-star resort and do whatever you need to do. That's fine. That's fine, okay? But during this week of soul winning, it's fine to be a little bit uncomfortable, okay? Yeah. Ladies, if you're used to fixing yourselves up a little bit more during the day and you know, you're not finding that you have everything that you need, hey, don't worry about it, okay? You're beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. You have beautiful feet as you go out and you Amen. preach the gospel okay. and men if you don't have the best night's sleep and not as you know comfortable well uh, you're men anyway you'll be fine you'll be fine okay uh, making yourself uncomfortable for the Lord but I am made all things to all men and we've come to Fiji so we're making ourselves as it were Fijian for the Fijians to be able to give them the gospel let's start there in verse 16 1 Corinthians 9 16 it says for though I preach the gospel I have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Okay? So what is Paul saying here? He says, necessity is laid upon me. The first point that I have for you this morning is, uh, you're made all things to all men, and so you're made to fulfill a need. Okay? Paul says there's necessity for him to preach the gospel. Okay? And the reason you're here, brethren, is that you've been made to fulfill a need. Like I told you, you know, God's organized this. I know, I know God used men to organize plans and dates and, and, and flights and all of this. But at the end of the day, it's been the Lord God, it's the Holy Spirit that is utilizing us to say, hey, there's a need in Fiji. And in the bottom of your heart, as much as you may have said at one point, oh, I'd be nice to get a Fiji. But in the bottom of your heart, the reason you're here is because you know there's a need in Fiji. Amen. You've heard Amen. the good news that this place is receptive. But as we drive around the streets, what do we notice? Churches that are Christian on the outside, but preaching obviously another gospel. Mm -hmm. We see the Mormons and their beautiful buildings. Okay, Look, there's a need in Fiji, which is why you're here. If you can keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians 9, can you come with me to uh, Jeremiah 20? Come with me to Jeremiah 20 in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 20. And while you're turning to Jeremiah 20, I'm going to read to you some familiar passages. But in Ezekiel 22 verse 30, God is speaking and He says these words. He says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, 
but I found none. You see, in this Old Testament time when Judah uh, was uh, taken into captivity by Babylon, God says, I was seeking a man. Of course, there was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a great preacher in that time. And as a great preacher, he was also locked up. You know, God is looking for another man. He says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a man who's going to stand in the gap. I'm looking for someone who's going to fulfill the requirements that I have, the need that this nation has. And you know what? Some time ago, God says, I need a man. I need a woman. I need somebody who's going to fill or stand in the gap, who's going to fulfill a necessity, a need in Fiji here at the end of May. And you know what he said? He said, yes, Lord, send me. He said, yes, Lord, I'll go. Yes, Lord, I'll make myself uncomfortable. Yes, Lord, I'll ask time off from work. There are certain sacrifices that you have made. Maybe you needed, you're taking your annual leave. Maybe some of you guys are taking leave even without pay. Right? And, and uh, you know, I've had conversations with some of you guys. And you're like, man, you know, uh, it's been a financial uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge to be able to come to Fiji because I'm going to be without work for a week and this and that. Hey, but you know what you said? You said, Lord, there's a need. I'm willing to stand in the gap. And that's why we're here. The first point is we're made to fulfill a need. We're made to fulfill a need. Another passage before we turn to uh, Jeremiah 20, uh, Galatians 6 and verse number 9. And this is another familiar one. It says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Amen. And look, this week, it's, uh, I'm really feeling the humidity. I, I, don't know, I don't know how we're going to go because we're going to get tired. Okay. And it's okay to get tired. It's okay to get weary. I understand. We get tired, we get weary as we do good. But the instruction is that we faint not. You know, when you start to get low on energy, okay, and you start to go, man, I don't think I can survive this week. I want you to pray to the Lord and ask, Lord, can you give me some of your supernatural strength? Amen. Amen. Can you give me the ability to complete this mission, this need that you've laid upon my heart? And you know, you, you know, again, uh, you know, the reason you're here is because the Lord has laid that need on your heart. Okay? Amen. Lord, I need to get out there. Some of you guys are experienced soul winners. You know you can go soul winning in your local city, your local surrounds. Some of you guys are new to soul winning. But whatever we are, whether we're going to serve as preachers or silent partners, God's put that need. And I'm encouraging you just this first day, this Sunday, Please, when you start to get weary, it's okay because we're being made uncomfortable, okay? But understand, there's a need. God's brought me here for a reason. It's unlikely that I'm going to turn up to Fiji anytime soon again. Use this time wisely that God has used you. Give everything you've got and faint not. Amen. You're there in Jeremiah 20, Jeremiah chapter 20. <coughs> Before we read Jeremiah 20, let me read again very quickly from 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Paul says these words, Woe is unto me! If I preach not the gospel, what is woe? Misery and sorrow. And look, there's always a part. I think, you know, we all have the human nature. We all have the flesh. And there's always a part of us that says, oh, I just don't want to go soul winning today. Don't feel like getting up in the morning. Don't feel like, oh, Fiji, all the way there, all these hours of flight. And, you know, uh, you know whatever it is, right? Uh, uh, there's a part of us that says, you know, maybe it's just better if I don't do this. And, uh, but I want to remind you that even when, when Paul sort of has those thoughts, he goes, no, 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 no. If I don't preach the gospel, this is going to cause misery and sorrow in my heart. And really what I want to help instill in your heart is this love and this desire not just for preaching the gospel, but the person that we're speaking to, seeing them as a soul that Jesus Christ has died for, a soul that Christ has paid for all of their sins. He suffered and died for that soul. As you talk to them, please don't think of them as a number. Think of them as a human being who's on their way to hell right now. And the Lord's brought you here, you know, to do a great work. You're there in Jeremiah 20. I don't want you to give up. You know, and they say, well, it's only day number one. I haven't given up. I know you've not given up. So I'm trying to encourage you now. Okay? You know, and look, if, if we get to like, like Tuesday and you're a little bit tired, hey, take a rest. Take a few hours. You know, uh, you know have extra sleep if you need to. Go do a bit of shopping if, if that needs to recharge your mind. But do it with a mindset that I'm doing this to recharge my batteries to go out tomorrow and continue winning some souls. Amen. In Jeremiah 20, verse number 7, because uh, Jeremiah wasn't a popular preacher. He was preaching at this time when Babylon was about to take over Judah. And people were not liking the message that God's judgment had fallen upon the nation. In Jeremiah 20 verse number 7, it says, O Lord, 
thou hast deceived me. Now, God did not really deceive Jeremiah, that's how Jeremiah's feeling. He goes, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and has prevailed. I am, I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. Now, this is probably not going to be your situation today. From what we hear in Fiji, people are receptive. But as Jeremiah's preaching, everyone's laughing at him, they're mocking him. They're saying, hey, what you're preaching is garbage, Jeremiah. And then he says this, For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, okay, this is Jeremiah. He goes, man, I've been preaching all these negative things. Everyone's laughing at me. Everyone's mocking at me. You know, obviously Jeremiah is very uncomfortable in his flesh at this point in time. Then he says in verse number nine, Then I said, I will not make mention of him. He goes, I'm not going to talk about God anymore. I'm done. Okay? Not speak anymore in his name. But then he says this, But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Mm. He goes, man, for brief, he briefly quits. He goes, that's it, I'm done as a preacher. I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm not going to preach God's word anymore. I don't know how long that lasts. <laughs> Maybe 30 minutes, and then all of a sudden he feels a fire in his bones. And he says, look, there's a necessity. I have to be used by God to preach his word, regardless of the outcome. And again, I just want to encourage you this morning, please. Look, I, I don't know, like obviously sometimes in, in our Western countries, uh, we can be mocked a little bit. We can be ridiculed, you know, as we go and preach. God, I don't think that we're going to experience that today, but just in case, you know, we're outside of our comfort zones. We're not in our countries. You know, if someone mocks you, laughs at you, challenges you, makes you feel stupid, you know, there might be a desire in your heart that says, oh, I just don't know if I really want to do this. But I want to just remind you of the great need that's here in Fiji, okay? And you're so important. You're going to be used by God. God's going to equip you, give the ability to preach the gospel, and you will see souls saved. Amen. Okay, you Amen. will see souls saved. So point number one, brethren, is that you're made all things to all men, and you're made to fulfill a need. Can you come back with me to 1 Corinthians 9? 1 Corinthians 9. And let's continue in verse number 17. 1 Corinthians 9, 17. What else are we made? 1 Corinthians 9, 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet, look at this, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. What else do we see of Paul as he's preaching the gospel? He's made himself servant unto all. That's point number two. Brethren, you've been made, serve, made to be servant, to be made a servant unto all. Amen. Amen. You know, servants are, think of a servant. Like you've got a master, you've got a servant, right? The servant is there to take care of the master. And that servant has to prioritize the needs of his master before he takes care of his own needs. Isn't that true? Like a, a certain master relationship might be your, your workplace. You know, you've got a boss, you've got an employer. You know, you, you've made an agreement with your employer. I'll be there from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., whatever your hours are. And I'm going to work these hours and I'm going to give my best. And you've made that agreement, right? You can't wake up one morning and go, ah, I just don't want to get work. No, no, like you, you've got a master, whether it's your, whatever employer you've got, you've got to get there and you've got to make sure you fulfill the needs of that company, that business, whatever it is. Well, Paul says he's made himself a servant, not just to a company, not to just like some church or something like this, but to all. Every single human being that he sees, he says, you know what? I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to lower myself. I'm going to prioritize their needs before my own. That was Paul's attitude when he made himself all things to all men. Number two, you've been made to be a servant unto all. So when you go out and you talk to people, okay, and as we're gathered here just today, I want to be look to look around and go, you know what, every single person right here in this room right now is my master. I'm willing to serve them. We ought to serve one another as God's people. Amen. But then as we go out and we know they're unsaved, we know they don't have the knowledge of the Bible like we do. You know what? Before you lift yourself up and I know all you know, hold on, you've been made a servant unto all. Okay, that requires humility. That requires for you to look at that soul and say, that is a valuable soul. 
Again, someone that Jesus Christ has died for. And I'm willing to make myself uncomfortable to serve them. How do we serve them? What's this mission trip about? To give them the gospel. Amen. To show them, hey, the way of salvation. Yeah. But please, don't lift yourself up mentally. Pride gets in the way. Pride can get in the way of your ability to win souls. You need to say, hey, I'm lowering myself. I'm here for this week. I'm making myself a servant unto all. Everyone that I come across is my master. They all have a need. And their need is to know the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to fulfill that need. I'm lowering myself to be made a servant unto all. Let me just quickly read to you from... Actually, you're, not, you're close by anyway. So just come back to the previous chapter. 1 Corinthians 8, please. These verses are very important to me, by the way. Okay, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. And the reason that why this is important is because I have a church of very knowledgeable people. 100%. A lot of my church members, and I know a lot of others that are here, know your Bibles really well. Okay? But I want you to remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 8.1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, I also want to my idols, but the, the principles here, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Amen. Amen. Knowledge is fine. Okay? You've got the knowledge of the gospel. That's fine. Okay? And you're going out there, you go, I want to, you know, give people the knowledge of the gospel that I have. And praise God for that. But you need the charity. You need the love to go with it. Okay? And look, I'm going to be just transparent and honest. The first few times in my life, in my early 20s, when I went soul winning first time, I did not really have a love for the lost. I didn't really want to do it. I just, I knew it needed to be done. And I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a try. And for a period of time, I was waiting, Lord, give me a love for the lost, so I'm just willing to get out there. But I, I realized over time that, you know what, that love will develop when I'm just doing what God's asked me to do. And as I went there and started to knock doors and I started to talk to people, and I realized just how lost people are, or how desperate some people are to know the second message of Jesus Christ, you know what happened in my heart? The love started to flow. The charity started to flow. Because I started to see these people as lost souls, individuals, real people that may spend eternity in hell forever and ever. And what torment to experience that. And how embarrassing, how shameful of me if I'm not going to be used by God to give them the gospel. We make ourselves servants unto all. If you want to, you can come with me quickly to... Um, 2 Corinthians, if you want, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. And uh, this idea of being a servant, I just want to keep going on, on about that, being a servant. In 1 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. Again, another very famous passage. But you know what? If you're saved, you are a new creature. There's a, there's a new life, okay, that is within you. The new man, the spiritual man, that which has been born again by the Spirit of God, that is within you. But what? why have we been given this new man, this new creature? Well, it says in verse 18, it says, And all things are of God, who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and this is so important, and hath given to us the ministry of, of reconciliation. What is ministry? Well, I'm a, I'm a minister. I'm a church minister. The word minister means servant. Okay, we've been made a servant unto all. God has given all of us, if you're saved, the ministry of reconciliation. You are here to lower yourself as a servant to reconcile a lost human being with their creator, the Lord God Almighty. And the verse number 19 says, to wit, that's to witness to preach, okay, to speak of, to witness that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto, uh, uh, unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So we bring reconciliation between lost man and their God. Amen. And we do that, as it says there in verse number 19, uh, uh, not imputing their trespasses up on, unto them. Showing them that their trespasses, their sins have all been paid for. You know, by the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection. 
That's point number two. I better hurry up. Can you come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, please. 1 Corinthians 9. Verse number 20. 1 Corinthians 9. Verse number 20. Now, verse number 20, you might think, may have no significance to you. We understand the time of Paul, as he was, you know, formerly a Pharisee. He's a Jew, right? Uh, he's been saved by Jesus Christ. And, hey, his heart's desire was to see other Jews like himself saved. He failed many times, sought out the Gentiles. But what he says here in verse number 20, he says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. We know that the Jews had a religion, the Jews' religion, the Pharisaical kind of uh, religion of that day. And he says to the Jews, I became as a Jew. Meaning that he was able to connect, he was able to relate to his former religion, the people of his former faith. He's trying to get them saved. Like, he's not just saying, guys, you're just, you're just a whole bunch of idiots for believing that. He knows himself. He was like that once. Mm. And so he's trying to learn so trying to be a servant, and trying to help these people understand, you know, and what, what is it with, with the former uh, Jewish religion? It's a problem. It says here, uh, it says uh, in verse number 20, uh, and, to, and to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I, might, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law. That I might gain them that are under the law. What's the problem with the Jews' religion? Is that they saw that their righteousness or their salvation was by keeping the law. They said, no, we're under the law. We need to do the law. This is what makes us right before God. And so he, you know, instead of just saying, hey guys, you guys are just idiots. He's able to lower himself to be a servant. He knows he was like that once. And with the help of the scriptures, obviously the Jews holding to the Old Testament scriptures was able to help navigate them to show that the scriptures always pointed to Jesus Christ. You say, how does that relate to me? Because we're not formerly Jews and we're not going out necessarily. We, I mean, we may come across a Jew. I don't know. I have no idea what the, what the population is like here in Fiji. But what's the, you know, how do we relate to this? Well, here's the problem with the Jews that they saw themselves as under the law. They saw themselves as trying to keep the law to be righteous. But here's the truth. Every false Christianity, every false Christian church is teaching salvation by the law. Are they not? Mm, that's right. Oh, just believing on Christ alone, that's not enough. You've also got to turn from your sins. Yep. You've also got to keep the commandments of God. You also, I mean, we've got to see some works in your life. Right? What, what work? Oh, just some works. Like, a lot of Christian faiths are like that. Okay? Essentially, what are they saying? We're still under the law. Yeah, we've heard of Christ. Yeah, we know He died for our sins, but we still got to play our part. We still got to turn from our sins and try to keep the law of God. Look, the, the, the feedback that I've, that I've had from Brother Sam and Brother Jackson here in Fiji is that people do have a fear of God. That they're receptive. They understand the saving grace of Jesus, but they don't understand that their faith ought to be on that alone. They're still listening to their, instead of reading the Bibles, instead of hearing great preaching and the right gospel message, they're still believing in a false gospel. Okay? In fact, that false gospel to me is a false Christ. Because my Christ paid for it all. Amen. Like, my Amen. Christ died for all my sins. He did everything that I need to be saved. <clears throat> their Christ is still asking them, you still got to play your role in order for you to be saved. They keep themselves under the law. And, um... You know, the Bible says, you know, this passage, James 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Amen. Of all. Salvation was never by the law. <laughs> okay? I mean, look, it's good to live a holy life, a pleasing life to God. Amen. Something that we can utilize. But the whole point of the law, I'll just read it to you in Galatians 3, 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ. Amen. That we might uh, be justified by faith. Amen. That we might be justified by faith. The law is a schoolmaster. I mean, it doesn't, it's not a waste of your Bible. All right? Reading the commandments of God, knowing where He stands, knowing what's holy and unholy, knowing what is righteous and what is wicked. It's there for a purpose, it's there for a reason. But as we look at the, the commandments of God, as we look at the standards of God, we immediately recognize, oh man, we failed. And once we recognize we failed, that's a schoolmaster to say, hey, I need a savior. I can't save myself, I need a savior. That's why it's so important that we show people, before we go straight to the gospel, we show them, hey, they're sinners, 
and as sinners, they're on their way to hell. Okay? So we're using the scriptures, we're using God's law to, as a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. And so obviously we can relate to this. Obviously we're not Jews, uh, but hey, we know many Christians and we're going to come across many Christians like this, okay, that are not saved. And they're trusting their works, they're trusting their church going, you know, to get them saved. And we need to make it very clear to them that salvation is faith alone on the finished work of Christ alone. Amen. Amen. Now, come back with me to 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 21. 1 Corinthians 9, 21. I've got three more points. Okay. Now, verse number 21 says, To them that are without law. So now we're talking about the Gentiles. Okay? To them that are without law as without law. So Paul is able to even change himself, make himself like a Gentile. He's able to relate to the Gentiles as well. But then it says this, you say, well, the Gentiles have no law, they've got no morals, they've got no guidance, they've got no instructions, they've got no commands. No, what it says here is that uh, being not without law to God, but under the law uh, to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. So not only does he have a desire to win Jews, he's really got a desire to win the Gentiles as well. Now, if you want to get a further understanding of what this means, if you, if you want, come with me to Romans 2. Keep, again, keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians 9. But come with me to Romans 2. Romans 2.14, please. Romans 2.14. Now, I'm sure the United States is similar to Australia. You know, when you knock on someone's door and you ask them, hey, you know, uh, what do you believe you have to do to go to heaven? You know, you often get a response like, well, I'm trying to keep the Ten Commandments. There might be something like that. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do the, the religious things. You know, that, that is kind of like the ones that see themselves as under the law. But then, like, with many Australians, I'll also say, well, I, I'm just a good person. Mm-hmm. Okay? They're, they're, not, they're not like, they're not um, looking at the scriptures, they're not looking at God's word necessarily as their standard to go to heaven. But they just think, well, I'm good. I, I, I'm better than the next person. I'm not like a murderer, I'm not a rapist, I'm not this and that, right? I mean, they just look at society and they think, well, I'm, I'm better than most people in society. Well, this is a description of someone as without law. Because in Romans 2.14 it says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law. Now again, when it says not the law, we're talking about God's laws here, right? It says, Do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So Paul is saying here, like, even the Gentiles, even though they don't have God's word, they still by nature do some of the things that are in God's laws. Okay? There are some things in our DNA as just human beings that we're going to understand is right and wrong. Okay? And it says here in verse number 15, which show the work of the law within their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness as their thoughts, the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. And then he says this in verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, look, look at the next phrase, according to my gospel. All right, so what he's saying, even though the Gentiles don't have the law like the Jews do, there is something within man, in their heart, God's written it in our hearts, to know that murder's not right. Like, we shouldn't just go around killing people, right? Like, we shouldn't just go around being a thief, stealing people's property. I mean, the average human being out there kind of recognize, whether they do it or not, but they recognize that that's not the right thing to do. Like, nobody wants to be killed. Nobody wants their possessions stolen from them, okay? And so this is generally, not, you know, the, the average person that says, well, I'm a good person. Again, they're not hearkening to the laws of God. They're not hearkening to, you know, some religious standard. They're just saying, in general, in society, I'm not as bad as others that are out there. I'm a good person. But at the end of the day, it's still the same position. They're looking at their own efforts, whether it's someone under the law or someone without law. They're looking at themselves, looking at their own efforts, their own achievements, as being hopeful that God will accept them into eternity. What I take out of this, brethren, is that, oh, by the way, point number four, I forgot, I forgot to mention it. But point number four is that we're made without law as well. Whether it's someone without the law, or under the law, or someone without the law, okay, the gospel message is always the same. This is what I love about preaching the gospel. Yeah. You know, whether you're under law or without the law, the presentation, the necessity of that uh, soul being saved, their understanding of what Christ has done for them, is the same. You know, one thing that stopped me soul winning in my late teens was I thought I needed an answer to every religion out there. If I come across a Buddhist, I need to know how to approach the Bible from a Buddhist perspective. I thought if I come across a JW, I need to approach the Bible from a JW perspective. 
if I came across an atheist, I have to make sure I've got all the arguments ready why, you know, uh, evolution's false or whatever it is, and all the arguments for creation. And I started to look at all this cr cross-section of people, and all their beliefs, and all the things they think they need to do, and I thought I had to have an answer for all of their philosophies and ideas. But then you go solving. And then you understand, oh, those that are with, with under law or that law, they all say the same thing. Yeah, I think I'm good enough. Mm -hmm. Or you've got to be good enough to go. And it's like, well, then it's easy. Just show them we're all sinners, right? Uh, there is none righteous, no, not one. And you start down that path. And the gospel message is the same. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you feel that way. Maybe you've got that in your heart right now. Oh, what do I say with this person? To come across? Don't, it's the same gospel message. Just show them none of us are good enough, ourselves included, right? Charity, not just knowledge, charity. Show that you care for this person. You're not just going through some plan. You're not just going through some script. Look at them in their eyes. Speak to them as a human being. Put a smile on your face. Show them that you appreciate who they are. Okay, regardless of who they are. And it's the same gospel message. This is what makes soul winning simple. You learn your plan. You have a heart for the lost. And you go out and you give the same message to all. Amen. This is what I think is amazing about preaching the gospel. Like, you know, if I'm preaching week in, week out for church, I've got to come up with a new sermon every week in, week out. So when you're preaching the same sermon again and again, and you're getting better at it as you go out, mm. all right? And you're answering questions and you're clarifying things better as you have more and more experience given the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, please. 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 22. Before we read verse number 22, let me just give those points again. We made all things to all men. Number one, we're made to fulfill a need. Number two, we're made to be a servant unto all. Number three, we're made under the law. Number, three, number four, we're made without law. And number five, we're looking here in, in uh, chapter, verse number 22. Just the first part of verse, verse number 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. What do you think of that passage there? To the weak became I as weak. This is where, you know, I've often associated this where I've knocked on someone's door and some elderly grandmother answers the door. Or a sick person comes and they're coming on the crutches or something like that, right? And, uh, you know, I'm probably going to be a little bit softer. I'm going to be a little bit more tender in the way that I speak. I might not be so bombastic in the way that I speak to them, right? I'm going to realize, hey, this person may be a bit elderly, right? Maybe a bit weak. And, you know, I'll say, look, do you need to take a seat? Like, I'm starting to think about this individual. So the weak became I as weak. Again, we're thinking about the needs of others first before Amen. our own needs. Amen. But before we, we mention that, I, I want to show you, because you're in 1 Corinthians. Come with me to, to chapter 2, please. I believe this is more closely related to the direct context of this passage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, the Corinthian church was a messed up church. If you've ever read the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians, it's a messed up church. You know, if you ever start to see complaints in your own church... I always encourage you, read 1 Corinthians, and then you'll find out the church is wonderful. Okay? <laughs> because this church is really messed up. And Paul did not give up on the church, and Christ did not give up on this church. Okay? But he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So when Paul's going out preaching the gospel, when he started this church, I'm not trying to show off. I'm not like, oh, look at my speech. Paul was educated. He was a Pharisee. Okay, he had great education. I'm sure he could articulate very clearly. But that's not what he uh, drove to do as he went to preach the gospel to the Corinthians. He goes in verse number two. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because all I cared about giving or speaking about and preaching about was Christ crucified. He wasn't trying to show his wisdom in all the fields of science and all the fields of philosophy and all the fields of... Give me something else. I don't know. Well, whatever it is, right? He goes, oh, my, my goal was to just preach Christ crucified to you. Amen. To Amen. win their souls. That's what his goal was, right? Then he says in verse number 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? That your faith 
should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Amen. Just in case you say, Pastor, I'm not a great speaker. You don't need to be. We need the power of God is what we need. Yep. We need to preach Christ crucified. Can you do that? You don't have to preach uh, on the end times. You don't have to preach why the, why the rapture takes place when it takes place. When you're going door to soul winning, right? Do you know about Christ crucified? Amen. Can you say, hey, my Savior died for me, paid for my sins, was crucified on that cross, rose again three days later. He did that to pay my way to heaven. He paid it all. There's nothing left to pay. It's a free gift. Are we able to communicate that? To the world, that's all you need to worry about, Man. you know. And uh, all the other wisdom and 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 uh, things that puffs us up as human beings, we need to set that aside and remember we're preaching Christ crucified. Man. Okay, so hey, you know we're made as weak, you know. And, and again, like it's it's such a simple message. Okay, it's a message that even the weak can preach. But I just want you to remember, we're not here to show off. We're not here to. You know, look at how much I know, and we know more than the Fijians and all this and that. No, no, we know Christ crucified, and you need to know Christ crucified. You need to receive that message, that gospel message of salvation. And so, point number five is that we're, we're made as weak. Again, that, that humility, it's all connected. Lowering yourself, putting everybody else you know, ahead of you, looking out for their needs. Again, being uncomfortable for the sake of others. This is what missions trip is going. To, missions trips are going to be about. Now, the second part of verse number twenty-two, and we'll finish on this. The second part of verse number twenty-two. So the week became eyes week that I might gain gain the week. And then it says this: But I am made all things to all men. Where we get the title from? Why? That I might by all means save some. That I might by all means save some. Brethren, we're made to save some. Okay, you've been made, you've come here to save some. We can't save all, okay, but we can save some. You can save some, I can save some, okay, each of us can save some. Look, I'm sorry if you're uncomfortable. I'm sorry, I, I, again, I don't, I, I'm kind of sorry, but I'm also not sorry, okay, because we're here to get out of our comfort zones, okay, at the end of it all. It's to win souls, okay? Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it's lovely to come to Fiji. It's my first time to Fiji. It looks beautiful. Some of the scenery just on the drive looks great. So that some of the uh, sea views, the ocean views, looks wonderful. But that's not why I'm in Fiji, okay? Maybe you've got a desire to try some Fijian delicacies and nothing wrong with that if you want to do that. But the reason you're here is to save some, though, okay? The reason you're here is to, to save souls. Maybe you're here and say, well, it's wonderful to meet up with other brothers and sisters from other churches. Praise God. Take advantage of that. But we're here to save some. We're here to save some souls. Amen. That's right. And so, look, there's nothing wrong with having some other activities and having a great time. I want to do that. I want to have some great time and have some other activities, get to know you guys that I don't know very well better. Okay? But I want you to know the whole reason we're here is to save souls. If not you, who? If Amen. not me, who? Amen. I mean, you know that. That's why you're here. Okay? And so I, I just want to give you that reminder, just in case you start to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Okay, you've got to change who you are. You know, you've come to Fiji, you've already changed the country you live in. Okay? And uh, you've got to be able to relate to the Fijians. And from what I hear, sometimes the Fijians are very receptive, very nice, where they'll go along with you. Okay? Now, their English is a little bit different to our English. Let me encourage you, slow down your speech. Even if it takes you an extra five minutes to get for the gospel. Slow down your speech so they understand what you're saying. Okay? And make sure that they fully understand. Like, ask them the questions after you give them the gospel, obviously. Make sure they've understood clearly. Okay? And they have the right answers to the questions you ask them. And once they've given you those clear answers, then obviously help them, lead them in a word of prayer that they may call upon the Savior and be saved. But obviously approach the way we talk to Fijians a little bit differently to how we approach you know, our American and Australian speakers that we're used to, okay? We're their way. That's a soul. We want to see them say, we don't want them just to go through some motions, be polite, say some words that they don't have faith in, okay? We're here to save some. So, brethren, just in conclusion, the six points I had for you today, okay? Uh, we made all things. I made all things to all men. Number one, we are made to fulfill a need. Number two, we are made to be a servant. Number three, we are made under the law. We are made without law. We are made as weak, and we are made to save some. Okay, let's pray.